Okay, uh, plenty of material there, I think, for some questions. What I'd like to do is take three or four questions at a time. Please, would you introduce yourselves? Please, would you... Um, uh, you can direct your question if you want. You can make a question, a general question to the panel. You can make a very short observation. I'm going to be really brutal. I can turn the microphones off. So please be concise. No long, long speeches, and then we'll get lots and lots of questions in. So can I see where the microphones are? One there. Is there just one? There's two. Perfect. Okay, first hand. Okay, lady up there with the sort of turquoise um, uh, top on. Sorry, it's probably not turquoise. I don't know. Uh, and can I see another question? Can we see another question, please? And the gentleman there. Can we take a microphone to this gentleman here, please? Okay, please, thank you. Could you introduce yourself? Yes. Hello, thank you very much. My name is Mihaela. I'm now I'm a PhD student at the University of Nottingham. My question is going to be very brief. Namely, at the current moment, as we have the International Criminal Court, and of course, I've heard the discussion and I respect the opinions of the members of the panel. There is a certain show trial element in every trial for international justice. My question is, looking at the world as it is right now, is it better to have the International Court, a permanent court, already established, functioning, set up on a statute that was obviously elaborated after diplomatic uh, deliberations, worldwide obviously, well, anyway, with a great participation from worldwide systems, legal systems, or would it be preferable to keep the style of ad hoc tribunals of national or hybrid uh, courts or just any other possible judicial solutions one could pick up in situations that arise and require the prosecution or investigation of international crimes? Mass atrocities. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. I'm going to take three more. So the gentleman here, can we bring the microphone down to the front as well for the next question? Hi, uh, my name is Mohammed Khair, and uh, I was actually uh, I worked for a few years as an uh, investigator with the ICC, and I had a question for uh, Professor K. Um, all the issues you raised uh, are issues I think that a lot of us who are starting to work in this field. Uh, are constantly questioning, uh, you know, and we're trying to uh, also um, find out whether or not uh, these tribunals um, can, can serve the purpose for which they were uh, established. Um, but uh, in your opinion, if the, um, if, um, and my understanding is that the tribunals are structurally, structurally flawed, uh, from, from the legal perspective, the prosecution's evidence is not strong enough, the judges are not doing their job well. Uh, there's a lot of political pressure that frequently guides the investigations and also the selection of the cases because let's not forget, as you mentioned, that a lot of the cases uh, are, are, are referred by the Security Council, for example, or the two ad hoc tribunals uh, are operating retroactively. Um, but the question for us is, uh, after the Second World War, we had all these uh, goodwill conventions. Yes, sir, there was the Convention of the Right of the Child, the Third, Four Geneva Conventions, the, all these uh, agreements that everybody signed on to. I'm from Sudan. We have a less than perfect human rights record, let's say. <laughs> and uh, Sudan jumped on just about every convention under, you know, under the sun. Um, but they were all systematically violated for 50 years plus. What can we do to implement uh, these conventions? This, does international law exist? And if it does, how can, we, uh, how can we see that it is preserved? How can we see that those who violate it uh, are, are held accountable? Uh, these cases you were mentioning uh, where uh, w whether we agree or not on the flaws, something happened. Something happened in Kenya. A thousand people got massacred in a few months in, in Darfur. Tens of thousands, if not more, were killed. Uh, the Lord Resistance Army for 20 years kidnapped children, raped, committed atrocious crimes. If the tribunals don't work, should they be fixed or should we get rid of them altogether? And if that is the case, what can be the alternative? Thank, Thank you, you very much. There's a gentleman here and then lady down just on the edge here is great. Okay, I've got you, but I'll get you in the next round, okay, at the back there. Okay, gentlemen, just here. 
Um, hello, um, my name is uh, Ron Jennings. I'm a fellow at LSE, um, and I work on global criminal justice. Um, so m my question is is to everyone, but, is, but especially to to Stephen Kay. Uh, it seems to me that that um, you know there there is a legal issue involved here as well as as the political claims, which I agree with. I'm in agreement with all the political claims, but that we haven't pushed far enough to see what's at stake in the, in the legal claim. Um, it seems to me the Tadic decision is quite explicit that there was no legal basis for it and that it understands that it is a teleo it says explicitly um, there's a teleological approach to law and that it understands um, law is expansive. It understands that the Security Council is being given the power um, as uh, essentially lawmaking power um, as, as the legislative power for the international tribunal in the absence of the existence of of, of uh, any power to do that otherwise. And so this is, an, it recognizes it as an emergency power, as a necessity, and as not strictly a legal power. It's very explicit about that if you read that. So the question is, how has this become the basis for international criminal law without there being more of an attack on this? And what are the implications of this? Especially when the problem is the idea that, that, that the Yugoslav, that the Rome statute is supposed to get around this but it does not because the ICC statute now brings in the dual jurisdictions that allow the Security Council to have dual jurisdiction. So the problem is what is the role of the Security Council as the embodiment of the emergency powers in the international arena as the body that is now the body that exercises the power to make the norm of, of legality in the international arena and what are the implications of that for the international order? Um, and, and in the final analysis, the question for, for everyone is, is who, how do we understand this new power that's being exercised in cases that involve the Security Council? Who is exercising the power to punish the criminal? And what is the name of the kind of power? Is, if it's not sovereignty, if it's not, when, when the prosecutor puts their name on it, what is the name and power that we should understand this being enacted in? Thank you very much. I'm going to, I'm going to stick with the three, and you'll be first, Madam, in the next round, because there's plenty in those three questions. So Stephen, I think, you should go first. Um, I'll, I'll run all three together. Um, Richard Goldstone um, said to me, um, is the world a better place, Stephen, for having it? And he was referring to the Yugoslavia Tribunal. And I said, yeah, it is. It is a better place because it's created a... a, um, a, a, a a beacon of standards for human behavior and the world is a better place for that and everyone was wanting something to be done answering the question uh, the last question uh, that we had during the Yugoslavia wars because we were all watching it and it was the first proper war that we'd watched each evening on the news you're probably too young to remember that looking at you but I remember watching it. Um, but my beef is this. It's honesty with the law. I don't believe in this stuff. Oh, we've got to do something about it. So therefore, you know, we have these laws, but we start changing because we want to trap someone here and we want to do it this way. I believe in a far greater honesty in the application of the rule of law and how it's dealt with. But looking at, at, at this whole problem to answer the second question and part of the third is the notion of sovereignty and sovereignty is almost like the religion of states isn't it, 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 it it's how we see the creation it, it, it's how we see the structure of the universe and that meeting in Skaveningen that I referred to in 2001 when the chap from Canada came up with the right to protect theory uh, is an inroad into sovereignty and the notion of sovereignty. And that's what you've seen in Darfur, the second question, uh, when you referred to that, is a change in the notion of sovereignty. And you've seen southern Sudan now, now also break, break away. So sovereignty is, is a big issue in, in all of this. 
but I'm just a, a defence counsel, right? I just like knowing when I'm going into play, like when I go to watch Tottenham, that I understand what the rules are and that we're all playing the same game. I don't like it fixed. I don't like the prosecutor going up the corridor to see Judge Jorda knock on his door and ask to have three indictments put together because the trial chamber only wanted one trial in Milosevic, and I know that happened because the clerk told me, all right? And some of you have worked at the Yugoslavia Tribune. We all know what goes on, and people tell us the stories. I don't like that, and that's the problem with international criminal justice, so-called. OK, right. thank, thank you, Stephen. Marty, you want to say a couple of things? <clears throat> um, the first question was, is the ICC better than the ad hoc criminal tribunals? Well, there is no general response to that question. You have to ask for whom yeah, it could be better. Uh, what I've learned in, in international institutions, UN-related institutions, uh, is that different people use them for different purposes and that they are pretty unpredictable animals as far as they go. If you think that you are able to advance your agendas better through, an, through a permanent institution, then go for it. If uh, a non-permanent uh, one, then go for it. Neither one is a panacea. Both, have, both of course, have problems. As Stephen Kay asked himself rhetorically, is the world a better place because of the ICTY? And then he said, slightly nervously, yes, it is. I just don't know this, but I'm worried that there is a ready ideological response to that question. We don't know. How do you measure this thing? We international lawyers, my profession, have been pro committed to believing precisely that sort of thing. It's an ideological, almost religious faith. Yes, of course. How many times have I sat on the plane back from New York from uh, one, uh, one of the General Assembly sessions when after the third drink on the plane, one person in the delegation says, well, poof, all these three months we sat there and, oh, but it, well, it's still better that it is there than it wouldn't be there. And I, every time I think, how do you know? Of course, it brings you to New York and it gives you this drink. <laughs> then there was the second question uh, about the Sudan, uh, about the conventions, about the rights of the, uh, uh, rights of the child, about human rights in general, international humanitarian law. It's a very sad story. It, it's a story to which also I think the right response is the response uh, uh, as the same one as the first one. Well, some of these instruments are better than others. Some of them are more efficient than others. There is no general um, response to the question. You also, with some despair, I thought, asked, well, does international law exist? That's, that's the, the, I don't think that, so I professionally, called upon to ask that question, but I always think that's the wrong question. The question to ask is, is international law a good thing? I, I don't know. <laughs> the last question related to how we should call the kind of power, I suppose the structure of knowledge, expertise, military, and economic power that is being waged in the world, but I don't think it, that power is centered in New York. New York is one of the places of, of which the military wing or some aspects of the military wing of this new power is operated. There are many other places from which it's operated. There are also many very classical words for that kind of a thing. And if I, I mentioned hegemony here and I realize that it's a... It's an old word, it's a burdened word, it's a weak word. There's no other word I can think of as better. Let's work on a good, better explanation. Thank you, Marty. Polina, you wanted to say something? Yeah, this is also in response to the question of uh, whether a permanent or ad hoc okay. uh, kind of a tribunal is, uh, would work better. And I, and I think um, Marty actually answered this question, well, at least to me, um, in, in saying that the, the problem with the ICTY was that the process, it's, or the, with Nuremberg, was that the process itself exonerated the responsibility of the broader political structure. Um, and it's actually, this I think is the, is the problem that the ICC as a permanent tribunal solves. Because part of the prosecutorial policy is to examine or to investigate and go after the full range of criminality. And 
um, for better or for worse, for show trial or not, you have seen the uh, prosecutor do that um, in uh, the DRC, both the Lendu and the Hema um, uh, crimes have been represented through the cases. Uh, you've seen it in Kenya with the government and the opposition. Um, and I think you will also see it with Cote d'Ivoire. Right now they only have Bagbo, but there's nothing legal or there's no jurisdictional uh, hurdle or there's no jurisdictional problem with uh, the, the prosecutor opening up a case against Watara's side and similarly in Libya. Um, so, so I think that's, that's probably one of the, the answers as to why a permanent tribunal is actually better. Okay, thank you. Plin, you want to say something, Rod? Sure. Um, so I want to make a comparison between the uh, Barbie case now and the Kenya case at the ICC, uh, which I find interesting because that's precisely what's here on the table now. So in the Barbie case, it was 39 prosecutors against uh, one person with one defense counsel venturing in there, Jacques Vergès. So and it was a show trial, and so that's the fundamental question. What do you do in such a situation, you know? And has Jacques Vergès really, you know, done his role as a defense counsel properly by exploiting those proceedings for his own political purposes, you know, and bringing the story of French colonialism in there. Which brings us to the Kenya case. And my first uh, intuition was that it actually it's a very different scenario, you know. There you have the ICC, a far more proper scenario, and Stephen Kay comes in as the defense counsel and gives legitimacy to the proceedings while he's quite well recognized. But at the ICC, if you think about it, you have an office of the prosecutor with 260 people working there, whereas you have an office of the defense with just six employees. So it's the same situation, rather, where this inequality actually exists. So it's an interesting okay. point. Okay, thank you very much, Robert. Did you, you can say it in 10 seconds. Okay, um, right, but not all 260 people are working on the Kenya cases. I mean, it's actually pretty comparable. Uh, if of you course, it. but still. <laughs> but still what? I mean, it's a, only so many people work on any specific case. And it's only, I, I'm, I'll tell you, it's 15 or so. I'm... Okay, all right. If you want to put your hand up, you can say something in there. Um, the lady in grey, you've been very patient. And then the gentleman at the back is next. And then... Uh, my name's uh, Kirsten Sellers, and I'm just in the process of completing a book about crimes against peace, which was a charge that died out after Nuremberg and Tokyo, and has now had a strange re revival in the discussions uh, at the International Criminal Court. And I think um, that charge kind of begs probably the most important question that did arise from Nuremberg, which is, why is it in apparently optimal circumstances when the Allies were united uh, on the question of the trial, where there was no other countries for them to answer to, where there was no international organization, for example, the Security Council, which is now a looming presence over the ICC, didn't meet until after Nuremberg had started. Why, given all of those circumstances, did the prosecuting powers have such enormous difficulty persuading us that Nuremberg law was valid law. And it does seem as if this is the perennial question in international criminal justice. There is always a drumbeat of dissent surrounding all of these trials, the ad hoc trial and the ICC, where some of the criticisms made at Nuremberg, that it was retroactive, and in particular that its selective law still haunts these international organizations. So, why the prosecuting powers today still having the same problems that they had in the past. Thank you very much. The gentleman at the back, and then the next question is over here, I think. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my question is to Professor Could you Martin. just introduce yourself, sorry? Uh, my name is Aul. I am a PhD student from University of Glasgow. Um, my question is to Professor Marty. Um, as a critical legal scholar, do you believe there is any transformative opportunity within the law that people who are dispossessed and excluded from the political process can use uh, the moment of, for example, the political trial to somehow intervene and transform the system? Do you believe that there is any value in pursuing a strategy of rapture, for example? Vergis might have used that strategy, you know, he used the, the, the space that the system gave him to sort of generate certain contradiction within the system, but did that really transform power relations, power structure in the French society, or would that simply allow the system to actually reconstitute itself and deal with the system? Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Next question here, I think. Um, hi, uh, Misha Zganets Rajay. I work for Amnesty International, International Justice Team, and um, I'm also a tutor here at SOAS. Uh, so my question is for uh, Stephen Kay. Well, I'd like to know what is your view on the power of the tribunals, like the tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, to assign uh, counsels, defense counsels, to the um, accused that actually want to represent themselves. For example, you acted as a, uh, you were assigned as a defense counsel to Milosevic, yet he wanted to represent himself. Because I find actually a bit hypocritical to criticize the trials uh, before the tribunals, yet you seem to be part of this show trial machinery. Okay, that's a good question. Okay, uh, next question is lady at the back, but I'm going to just, just hold that thought. Um, I will take one more. The lady at the back with the red scarf, I'll we'll take her. And then Nabila is the next question, just here, in the front here. Um, no, just there, there. My name is Kanika, I'm from Birkbeck. And my question is for the panel. When we're using the term show trials and political trials, how do you define them, and do you see a distinction between the two? Thank you very much. Okay, we'll take those four questions. Thank you. Uh, Marty, do you want to go first this time? <clears throat> okay, first was the question, why is it so difficult for the prosecution still to maintain legitimacy? Uh, why is it for the international criminal law system still so difficult to... Uh, to speak to the world with a convincing voice? It was that after the Nuremberg, it still seems to be. And I think there's just one answer to that question. That law, and criminal law in particular, is a reflection of the society in which it exists. In domestic societies, we have a dense system of values, procedures, authorities, to which we accede more or less. And we don't feel the fact that we get a parking ticket a scandal. The prosecution acts within a very dense framework of shared values. Internationally, the distance between 1945 and today is almost non-existent. There are no shared values out there. There are no shared uh, institutions and, and procedural systems. But there is an enormous gap between the way in which people are treated all over the world. There can be no single system that represents in a somehow unproblematic and legitimate uh, way a world that's on fire. And the second question was uh, to the uh, friend from Glasgow. So is there any transformative aspect to law? As a critical scholar, is, is the strategy of rapture, rapture still possible? Does it lead anywhere? Well, there would be, so uh, one traditional way to respond to that question would be to say that law cannot have a transformative potential. By definition, law is the expression of the powers that be and solidifies their power in the very many ways uh, through which it can. Ergo, only revolution uh, can help. Now, that's a very traditional way of looking at the world. The dichotomy between law and revolution, I think, is watered down by what we know. I think there are bits and pieces of resistance that can be uh, used in law. You can t t take parts of law and use them strategically in situations that you are able to achieve a transformative social effect through those uses. But again, there, I cannot give you a general formula as to what are those situations. I suppose to have that strategic sensibility needs um, a, a political uh, assessment of the situation that, and um, uh, therefore cannot be generally given. I, but I still think the strategy of rupture, and I'm, uh, that, that, that always has a role to play. It's always possible. Even in the parking ticket case, you might say, well, I just don't pay it, damn it. And you because I don't accept this. And well, sometimes it's ridiculous, sometimes it's less ridiculous. The parking ticket situation is something that all of us every day face in one way or another. I think the world is more complicated than the old traditional left uh, dichotomy between legality and revolution uh, suggests. Okay, great, thank you, Stephen. Um, very interesting question, why we still have this same debate. I I've often wondered that as well. Um, do you know, the fact is that we crossed the Rubicon each time, and Nuremberg, we crossed it and then went forward, and then the Yugoslavia tri Tribunal 
1993, we crossed another Rubicon by establishing it, and then we had the judgment when the judges didn't vote themselves out of a job, and it's only been going forward. Um, the ICC, of course, is treaty-based, and it, 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 it's a club, so it, it's a very different concept. Um, what always fascinated me was why they didn't go to the General Assembly with the uh, first ad hoc tribunal <coughs> and establish a general power of ad hocism. Um, but that wasn't in the interests of the Security Council, as I think you probably know, and so that wasn't going to happen. Um, taking the second question about intervention, do you know, there's a lot of intervention. Uh, there's coalition of the International Criminal Court, all these NGO groups who send me stuff every week and loads of other people saying what they're doing and uh, disseminating um, ideas. Uh, that has a great influence on a general level with what people do uh, and think. And through that medium, they're based out of the ICC, they try and shape opinion within the ICC. I had a row with the International Crisis Group a couple of weeks ago because they wrote a report that was, they thought they were going to lose the Kenya case actually and they'd given a report that your side had put in as, as, as evidence. They thought they were going to lose it and so they wrote this sort of apology type uh, newsletter and then blaming me for manip manipulating the media and I'd, I'd never spoken to the media and the whole time I've done the case. Um, you know, Ocampo is on TV every bloody night. So. Uh, I wrote a, a stinking letter back and then they had to change everything how they, they dealt with stuff. So too much intervention actually, stay away, go and demonstrate outside in the streets is my advice because just let the law go about its business. Self-representation issue, you probably don't know this, um, originally I was an amicus curiae and he got his rights taken away because he was uh, very sick. And the last words he said after the trial chamber took his rights away and appointed me as assigned counsel was, Stephen, appeal this. And off he went round the back. So what do I do? Do I just tell him, you know, pee off, um, I'm not going to do that? Or do I appeal and get his rights back? Because he wasn't recognising the court and never filed any pleadings. So in fact, he told me to file pleadings, appeal my appointment, try and overturn it, and get his rights back. So what happened was, I appealed it, got his rights back for him, and the court kept me as assigned counsel, and that suited him very well. I used to go in every morning and have a cup of coffee with him and a sandwich, and discuss what we were gonna do in court. And in fact, his last phone call before he died was to my office, telling me what to do the next day. So what you see on the self-representation issue actually wasn't the actuality, wasn't actually what happened. But what was interesting was he wanted to present a, a picture of fighting his case in a particular way, and it served his purpose how they presented that case against him. <coughs> but he actually engaged in the legal process. He didn't rupture anything and withdraw from anything. And I always wondered on the first day whether he'd not show up to trial on February the 12th, 2002, but he showed up and engaged and asked us to do all the law for him and also aspects of cross-examination. -exam so sometimes these issues are not actually hypocritical, but there, there was a reason behind it. Um, and in, I visited uh, the, the mortuary and saw the body with his son, um, uh, when he came to Gletton and he told me uh, about various aspects of his father's views when he spoke to him every week. So uh, what had been given Milosevic there was a massive opportunity to play out his side of the story and people then complained about it because he was only doing what the others were doing back to him. Thank you, Stephen. Can I take another round of questions then? I just want a brief comment. Okay, very brief. Uh, on this, because Stephen Kay promised me that I can crack the following joke tonight on the basis of uh, Jacques Vergès wrote to Milosevic a couple of times, uh, expecting a response uh, from Milosevic, and the correspondence was discontinued internally in the court by Stephen. So. <laughs> 
Okay, I'm going to take Nabila, and then the gentleman here in the light shirt, and then one other, and then the guy at the back there in the middle, and then that will have to do, I'm afraid, and then we'll wrap up. So Nabila, this guy, and then in the middle at the back. <coughs> uh, thank you. Nabila, please. I'm Nabila Ramdani, a freelance journalist. I'm actually surprised that the name of Saif al-Islam Qaddafi, uh, a London University alumni, hasn't come up at all tonight. Uh, I'd be fascinated to hear the, the panel's views on on what could clearly be described as a show trial in the making. I missed it. Do you Saif Qaddafi? You mentioned. I missed the name. Sorry. Uh, Saif al-Islam Qaddafi. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Hello. Uh, my, my name's Usman. I. Uh, I'm a former SOAS student. It's a question for Professor Koskeniemi, um, who talked about shared values and questioned whether, whether they existed. Um, I just wanted to ask him if he thought that the International Criminal Court, with its principle of complementarity, um, offered the opportunity to discover any shared values that we might have, um, imagining international criminal justice as perhaps it does as a process of dialogue and translation. Um, I wonder if you could comment on that. Okay, thank you very much. And then the gentleman at the back there in the middle with the last question. Um, hi, Sahib Singh from the University of Cambridge. I'm a PhD student and uh, a lecturer at the University of Vienna. Um, I actually have a question for both Stephen Kay and Marty. Um, and I feel slightly guilty about actually making something quite committed and personal, such as international criminal justice, quite abstract, but it's this notion of the strategy of rupture, which I'm really interested in. And I want to address it from two perspectives. One is the idea that, in fact, the fact that Stephen is a defense counsel in numerous tribunals, and the idea of a participant as actually contributing to the strategy of rupture, because it strikes me as that Tadic was the strategy of rupture. The jurisdictional phase was the challenge to the hierarchy. It was, it was that that sort of discourse. So what role do you perceive yourself as having in the larger strategy of rupture? And to Marty, my question is, in terms of the progressive potential of international law, it strikes me that the strategy of rupture is fairly central. And if it is, if we can conceive it of, of as fairly central, what gives any strategies of rupture traction? what legitimizes certain strategies of rupture and delegitimizes others? And I, I, I use the language of legitimation very cautiously, but I think perhaps more accurately the term is what provides certain strategies of rupture traction and others not, and especially in international criminal justice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, think about, you know, they're saying this, but is that right? Um, so I've never sort of built myself up into being a rupturist or um, a believer in the temple of rupture. I remember going to um, Arusha and that you had lots of rupturists there. I think it comes out of France. It was a lot of French Canadian lawyers, a lot of French guys. I was the only English speaking defense counsel um, and Everyone was not cooperating or this, they weren't gonna, they weren't gonna go to Rwanda to investigate defenses. And I'm thinking, what the bloody hell use is that, mate? You're not gonna get your bloke off because they're gonna pot him. Um, they're gonna pot him anyway, whether you go there or not. A and I decided that wasn't for me. So I said, I'm going into Rwanda and went and no one beat me up or did anything nasty to me, which they probably um, regretting, but I, I went there and came back with a load of good defense evidence, complete alibi. Okay, lost the case, but the judges were absolutely stank. And um, there we are. And then everyone else went after that, because I'm not sure it's a modern trial theory. Um, there's some very other eminent defense counsel in this room tonight. And I'm not really sure we do that these, these days. We, we, we tend to engage and, and take on the cases. You've got to go for a particular kind of guy for that kind of thing, and then do your time afterwards, do your 40 years um, thinking about his structure of um, 
you know, rupture, structure of rupture, whatever it is. Strategy of rupture. <laughs> but Strategy it doesn't scan quite so nicely. Um, Polina, would you like to have a, yeah. a minute? Um, I just want to expand on what exactly is probably likely to happen with uh, Saif al-Islam Qaddafi. Um, so, so following the Security Council resolution, the ICC does in fact have jurisdiction over, over Libya. And they uh, collected evidence, but the evidence... The, and issued an arrest warrant. But the arrest warrant concerns crimes only committed over a two-week span um, about this time last year, and Saif is um, being held responsible for uh, aerial bombardments of protesters. Um, so, so Libya, uh, or the NTC, or whomever is holding Saif, they want, to, they want to keep him there. And the Minister of Justice of the NTC has come out and said that they intend to try him in Libya. And so the only legal mechanism through which that can happen is for Libya to challenge the admissibility of the case at the ICC and to kind of take the case back. And in order to do that, they need to prove that they're charging the same person for the same conduct in Libya. And, um, and uh, a, a similar situation happened with Kenya la last summer, and what the pretrial chamber ruled was that you actually had to have quite concrete investigative actions, that you couldn't just announce that you were going to investigate and then not do anything about it. You actually had to collect evidence, meet with witnesses, um, et cetera. And obviously the situation in Libya is quite unstable, so if they were to challenge the admissibility right now, they would probably be, it would probably be thrown out by the pre-trial chamber and then they would probably ask Saif Qaddafi to be sent back to The Hague. Um, so what they've actually done is, is a, I think it's under Article 94, they've requested for a postponement of the um, execution of the arrest warrant. So essentially what they're doing is they're asking for more time. Uh, so until they can actually do those concrete investigative actions that will allow them to um, you know, challenge the admissibility. Um, but in effect, it's probably just... I mean, if, if, they, if, they, if they don't want to give him to The Hague, they, the court can't really do anything. The court doesn't have any real enforcement um, body or, or, or function in that, in that matter. So, um, I mean, the question remains as to whether it's just kind of both sides trying to save face and play by the rules, but, in, but the outcome's already kind of predetermined. Thank you, Polina. Robert? Sure. Just uh, three very short points uh, on Libya. I find it very fair from the ICC that they actually have embarked on looking into the father, Gaddafi, um, to see whether that actually was a war crime. And it was actually Gaddafi's daughter who made that submission to the court. We are an Israeli defense lawyer. And uh, she's a lawyer herself. She, she was on the defense team with Jacques Vergès uh, for Saddam Hussein. So I just want to say that's actually quite a fair thing from the prosecutor to do, so looking at both sides. Secondly, for the rupture defense, I think Milosevic was the master of all rupture defenses that uh, existed uh, so far. I mean, you know, he literally subverted the court uh, in such a skillful way that, uh, you know, many lawyers who do embark on rupture defenses can learn from this. And as a third point, yeah, I just want to thank you for all coming and uh, very happy that we managed to <laughs> pull this event out of the bag still in the past 30 hours, and that's all for me. Thank you, Robert. Marcy, would you like to wrap up? <clears throat> The rupture defense, Sahib, the rupture defense has traction in those situations where the prosecution system and the accused system collide completely, where there's no shared ground whatsoever, where the prosecution is so unjust, so wrong, so absolutely out of this world that there's nothing to be done with it. So um, at, that, at those points, um, International criminal lawyers are not good as defense counsel. Stephen Kay uh, already admitted that he's the kind of guy who would not do this, but who would want to have his uh, client acquitted. In a real show trial situation, there is no chance in hell you get your client acquitted. There are more important things at issue in, show tri in, in trials of rupture. I don't think the, um, the Milosevic trial was a rapture trial in the least because they never got into attacking the prosecution system, the International Criminal uh, uh, Tribunal for Former Yugoslavia. I think of uh, Socrates, and I ask whether Socrates would want to have Stephen Kay as his counsel, <laughs> and I think that the effect would somehow be lacking. Uh, second, uh, 
two questions in the air. The, the question from the, the person from SOAS about shared values and the, the usefulness of criminal tribunals in declaring shared values. That is a very common justification we hear, because we cannot rely on the preventive uh, mechanisms of international criminal law. We say we use these in order to, sh to declare shared values. Well, damn it, who was it in this world who didn't know that genocide was not a good thing to commit? That to put people in mass graves was not a nice thing to do. Who needs con being convinced of such things? The problem in this world is not at all that we wouldn't agree on values. The problem is, why don't we act with those values? The last question, which nobody had responded, I also forgot that, was the question about what is a definition of a, of, a slow, of a show trial or a political trial. I've been thinking about that a lot. And two things I, I want to say. One is that a trial is not a show trial or a political trial because of any property in the trial itself. Every trial is a political trial in the specific sense that I suggested at the beginning. It affirms, reaffirms, and strengthens a system of power, of values, prefer and preferences. It's, it also declares those. But that's uninteresting. I suggest that a political trial or a show trial is at issue at the moment when we feel in our guts that something is taking place that should not take place. It's not there, it's in us. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'd like you to thank uh, panelists, Polina, Stephen, Marty, and Robert. And as we thank them all, I'd just like once again to thank Robert for putting this panel together. So thank you very much. Now remember, you're not supposed to move until we've left the... <laughs> I think we'll be oh, safe, you, so please, uh, so please feel free to leave. <laughs>